Dive inside your own critical thinking patterns with expert Bethan Wynn. Bethan takes time to clearly explain some of the common thinking and decision-making biases and fallacies that we all fall prey to and the impact they have while navigating our everyday life. She also explains the difference between our instinctive reactive thinking patterns and the more deeper considerative patterns and when and how we access them. The conversation then goes deeper into exploring emotions and thinking and the role that they play and the influence they have on us. This is a fantastic and hugely approachable and engaging conversation. Bethan's gratitude and passion for this area is clear from start to finish. For the listener, it provides a clear framework for greater self-awareness and reflection on the mechanics of how your own thinking patterns and decision making affect your everyday life. So enjoy. Bethan. Hello and welcome back to WA Real. I'm your host, Bryn Edwards. Critical thinking and the role of thoughts and emotions are where we're going to go to today with my guest, Bethan Wynn. Bethan, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> well, excited to be here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we first met through interacting on Instagram, of all things. Yep. That's right. Yep. Um, and then recently where we sparked up a discussion about the... the the power of thoughts and the power of emotions. Mm -hmm. I think I put a post that was like, thinking is the ultimate human resource. And uh, you immediately jumped on and told me, no, you're wrong, it's feeling. I didn't and say no, I was wrong. <laughs> I think I mentioned something about, you know, power versus force and, and, and emotions and stuff. And that yeah. is what we'll dive into yeah. in a bit. Yeah. So to start off with, um, one of the questions I like to ask all my guess is how they came to be in WA. Um, so you moved here nine years ago, 2011. Mm -hmm. yep. um, what brought you here and why? Um, work, my husband's work. We were living in London and uh, I was teaching at a high school. He was working in the city. Um, and we were thinking, gosh, this is quite hard work and quite stressful. Um, oh, London? Yeah, yeah um, and particularly teaching I loved it but it was you know very little time off in the term time and stuff so um, we were looking at our options um, we were going to go we'd read uh, Tim Ferriss's four-hour work week we were going to go and live on a beach in South America and all this and then my husband said oh there's a little bit more credit card debt than I think you know about <laughs> <laughs> so I said right well we need you to get a job um, and so yeah he put his CV out there and we thought Sydney or Melbourne perhaps, but um, yeah, Perth, someone came back within a couple of days, offered him a job um, pretty much straight away. And we said, sure, why not? Looks nice, there's sunshine and beaches and let's give it a try. And it was as simple as, and deep as that. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. We thought, well, let's just go and try it. Um, yeah. So with the intention of coming for a year or so and going back to get married, because we just got engaged before we left. Um, and uh, nine and a bit years later, here we are, still here. <laughs> Tell me about the transition to moving here, because it's very similar but very different all at the same time. Mm, yeah, yeah. I I thought it would be oh, it's basically the same. You know, I've got yeah. family in Adelaide and Queensland that we've visited yeah. before, so um, everyone speaks English. It's part of the Commonwealth. It's just yeah. be like England on a sunny day all the time. Yeah, but it was very good from a cultural perspective for me to. Um, be challenged on little things like the postcodes. You're like, well, where are the letters in the postcode? This yeah. is weird. <laughs> um, or swearing on the radio. Um, yeah. We're just talking about swearing. <laughs> uh, so, you know, on the BBC, None it's of it. very clean. You know, Radio 1 is aimed at the same audience as Triple J, for example, but there's no swearing. If you swear, you get in trouble. Uh, or that's how it used to be. Um, whereas over here, you know, I've got my kids in the car and I'm regularly like, oh gosh, swap the station. Enough. <laughs> there's all sorts of naughty words and topics come out. So, uh, so yeah, it's just funny little things like that. Mm. And what I do really like about Perth that's different from the UK is um, how friendly people are and how they'll take the time to just have a little chat you know, uh, when you're ordering your coffee or at Woolworths or whatever. Um, I think in the UK, particularly in London, it was very much like you walk into a shop and you say, can I have whatever? Or you're just paying and you're like, please and thank yous, of course, because we're British. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> but um, there's not the, oh, hey, how's your day going? And mm. um, 
you know, and, and there's a lot more independent businesses out here, like small coffee shops and stuff, and so you see those people over and again, um, and I, I really like that, and I notice the difference when I go home, yeah. um, how cold and transactional a lot of those interactions can be, whereas here, you know, there's just more of a relaxed, how's it going vibe, which yes. is nice, you know. Sometimes people are like, oh, it's a bit fake or whatever, but yes. sometimes you get some really funny conversations with people and it's, yeah, it's fun. Right so is it day. home now? Mm, on my mobile phone, home is still my mum's house. In, in Wales. Wales. But um, yeah, I don't know, it's definitely transitioned, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. so to be. Yeah, and you know, my kids are born here and stuff, so we're not planning to move back anytime soon. Yes. Yet. Yeah. And do you get the opportunity to pull out your Welsh very often here? In Not so much. Oh, I think I know one person. Hi, Emma. <laughs> um, one person here that speaks Welsh fluently. Um, one of a, a good friend of mine is actually from Anglesey as well, but his Welsh is pretty rusty. Um, but I speak Welsh to my mum on the phone and yeah. um, uh, some school friends on WhatsApp and stuff. But texting in Welsh and WhatsApping in Welsh. <laughs> takes a lot longer because autocorrect. Well, just the autocorrect changes everything, so you have to like type it out properly. Mm. Um, Do you get Welsh on as a language on the iPhone? I think so. I'm not sure. My friends at home would know better than me. There are um, uh, like spell check for Welsh, obviously, yeah. um, and lots of programs and apps that mm. are in Welsh, um, but. Yeah, I don't use them. I do read Welsh books to my kids right. regularly, so they know, you know, their right. colours and their numbers and just yeah. the simple things. Yeah. Basic stuff. Yeah. So, as well as being a mum and a wife, you've been teacher, trainer, fascinated in people, the way they think, <laughs> yeah. learn, do life. Yeah. Where does that come from in the Bethan journey? Uh, that story. I don't know. Um, teachings a great thing to do like I think I'm a very um, social people kind of person um, and you know I just love talking and chatting to people um, particularly you know being off work with kids going from talking to people interacting with people all day every day to spending a lot more time at home mm. was um, yeah you go oh actually people like me, <laughs> need people. Yeah. Um, the idea of sitting at home by myself writing sounds quite romantic, but actually I would not last a day, I don't think. Really? <laughs> yeah, I, um, yeah, and so, you know, you're at home with the, with the kids, y you can go the whole day without seeing another adult sometimes, and those are not good days for me. Like, I really thrive on social interaction. And I think I've been reflecting on that a lot more over the last few years as well. Um, and how people are not designed, like, you know, if you think about primitive times, if you were by yourself, you wouldn't survive. You need your tribe, you need your group mm. um, to support each other. Um, and, you know, mobile phones are great from a communications point of view because, you know, there'd be mother's group messaging each other throughout the day. And you'd be like, oh, yeah. does somebody want to go to the park or do you want to get coffee or whatever? So there is that support. but. Nothing quite replaces face-to-face um, -face interaction with people. No. Um, I think, you know, we talked previously about how great it can be to just sit down and have a real thoughtful conversation with someone. Mm. And we're both in privileged situations where we get to do that regularly. Um, yes. And, yeah, that critical thinking stuff kind of came about because um, I was asked to write a course at work at um, Taylor's College, which is connected to UWA for the pre-master's unit, and I was like, oh, this is really interesting. It was a couple of years ago. And, I was, and the course was about critical thinking. Yeah, yeah, it was exactly that. It was for um, sort of international students uh, who wanted to go and do a master's at UWA, but like a bridging unit. Um, it hasn't actually come to fruition <laughs> as of today, but, um, but I wrote the course and I carried on studying it and I went to do more work on it. And then I was speaking to people and they're going, that's really cool, that's really interesting. Um, so that's kind of where the business has come from yeah. and um, yeah. Sounds like it really sort of lit a little fire inside of you. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I always thought that I would do something a little bit different, but I didn't quite know what that was going to look like and I'm still figuring out what that looks like. Um, but 
you know, it's kind of fun experimenting and working mm. it out. Um, you know, some people um, are kind of born to be teachers, like school teachers. Mm. Um, and I never quite felt that, you know. I, yeah. I worked for Oxfam for a little bit after uni um, and uh, vo another volunteer organisation. And then I did my teacher training and then kind of fell into that at doing the high school thing in London and was like, oh, this is really stressful. And hats off to the people that stick it out and are still there. Like, you need some rocks those people that are just there for years in the same school and they've taught the mums and the dads and they yes. teach the kids i think that's amazing um but it wasn't it wasn't for me um so yeah you know i've been really lucky here working at taylor's um love working there and may well still go back but is on casual rolling contracts so i'm like well you know let's try something and see what happens and, and so taking critical thinking out into the world is yeah, that yeah and it's really fun you know like but like you do in your podcast you get to meet really interesting people and um because it's about reflection um you know you get deep with people very quickly about yeah. their values um how they think what they um prioritize in life um we talk about biases arguments fallacies things like that which is kind of philosophy but there's also a bit of psychology a bit of mm. thinking patterns um system thinking stuff um and people are, are very open i think most people enjoy a good conversation if you sit down and say okay i'm here to listen and put some frameworks on stuff but you know spill your guts and and people do and and it's really wonderful to connect with people like that mm. Um, and, and they make some big choices sometimes as a result of doing critical thinking training. I've had uh, four people now, I think, quit their jobs after having done the course. Excellent. <laughs> right? Um, I feel like I need to put a disclaimer on it. Like, you know. I did, uh, earlier in my career, um, many years ago, mm. we delivered some training that went deep into people. And it was uh, generally in call centres with mobile phones and banks in the UK and we had to put a disclaimer in there that if we do this there's a possibility that at least five percent of the people will choose to leave the job mm. and to start with it, my clients were like what mm. I said well that's a good thing because mm. then they shouldn't be there yeah true true yeah I, it's not me pushing these people yeah to yeah, quit. yeah it's definitely but it's them coming to their own realization exactly so before we dive into some of the stuff around critical thinking and I'd like to explore and capture some of the things around particularly around decision making and biases and things people should know. Mm. Just, a, just a further question in terms of you and your relationship with critical thinking. Mm. Um, you must have seen something in terms of an impact or felt something in terms of an impact when you first interacted with it when you were putting that course together mm. in terms of the impact it can have out in the world with people individually and collective. Mm. What is that impact that you saw or you still see? I guess it's that um, encouragement to reflect. I think um, I'm big on you know community and connection with people, um, but we're in such a kind of busy, fast-paced, distracted environment most of the time, you know, mobile phones and trying to keep up with you know exercise and eating well and work and financials and everything and all um, the stories we tell ourselves yeah and all <laughs> the stories we tell ourselves and and it's very easy to just be caught up on that treadmill and mm. the thing that was most powerful for me was it was um uh, like an opportunity to stop and think and reflect on okay is this what i want to be doing is this the kind of life i want to lead is this where i want to be right now with kids my the age they are and uh, with my husband and friendships and stuff um, and so I saw that for me was really useful and powerful um, and then um, you know I've seen that in people that have done my training now as well they were like oh I hadn't really thought about it I was just caught up in the busy and the stress and the and you go well, there's always a choice life doesn't have to be you know this that way whatever you choose to be um you know you don't you might i was chatting to someone at coffee this morning she was saying oh i'm worried about my colleague who got made redundant she's just got this big mortgage that she's gonna have to pay by herself i'm like well she could sell the house you don't have to live with that stress 
mm. and we kind of feel like we ought to sometimes or something and and it's only when you sit back and go oh hang on a minute I can do this differently you know um, if it's if it's not working there's always alternatives you know mm. um, and you know if you go 30 years down the track and you've been in the same job and you're just grinding away and then you wake up and go ah oh, how did I get here this oh, is not what I thought I would do <laughs> yeah this yeah. is not how I thought my life would be but um, if you don't reflect then you don't kind of realize mm. until later on there's a lot of power in that Te taking a moment instead of going from A to B A to B A to B yeah going to C yeah. which is watching you go from A to B that's a nice analogy yeah yeah and reflecting on it yeah and and taking stock yeah you know, a lot of some of the work that I did as a business consultant was the, the whole thing of pulling people from in the business to on the business mm. and um, it it is that I, I almost feel it's um, morally incumbent upon everybody to spend at least a few minutes a day or 20 minutes a week reflecting on how you're doing life because mm. if it's not working for you well a you're mugging yourself and b you not, not you're denying everybody else the best mm. version of you as well mm. I know it sounds a bit sort of coin crap but it's very very true mm. yeah definitely I find um, I've got similar to yourself here a little community where I live and a lot of my neighbors are in their 90s and they're like amazing women mm. I'm just like wow I want to be like you when I get to your age um, mm. but I find that very useful um, as a reflection point mm. of talking to them and going you know well what's your advice or what do you think or yes um, you know I've got quite a few friends that are you know 10 20 30 years older than me and I, I, I love just sitting with them and going what was it like for you at this stage or you know what do you remember about this mm. or why did you choose that um, and and you know the little pearls of wisdom they come out with oh it's gold yeah absolute yeah. gold yeah, and you know that, that's half the reason why I created WA Real to the oldest form of learning by shutting up and listening to the stories of others yeah. around me yeah and and through that I think you've tapped into something that um, I've long felt which is that um, we don't listen to those who are older than us. Mm. I read an article recently that that started. It's our parents' fault, apparently. If you oh, want to check let's some, blame our parents. You want some blame? <laughs> no. Sorry, um, Mum. It was because uh, there was. There was uh, I read a fantastic article that pinned it on uh, the, the children of the sixties who were like, "Stick it to the man. If you're older than thirty, I don't want to know about you. We've had enough of this authoritarian yeah, dictator." Okay, yeah. And now it's coming down, down, and down. So yeah. we almost get to this point where, you know. People of our age sometimes look at millennials and go, oh, jeez, you know. And, and, but they're just the next generation of, mm. I know it now. Yeah. And yeah. so, yeah, but there is still power in coming out of yourself and listening to those that yeah. either A, know more, B, yeah. experience more, and through that, maybe older than you or. Yeah. yeah. I think, yeah, there's a couple of things with that. Like, if you think you can only learn from someone that's smarter than you, you're mm. missing out on a world of so learning. Much. Because, yeah. you know, maybe they're not smarter than you at maths, but maybe they're great at relationships. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? You know, we all have very different like strengths. D's across the board at school. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then they're being exactly. millionaires. So you might want to have a listen to them exactly. if you're not a millionaire and you'd like to have them. Exactly about. that, yeah. Um, and um, what else did you just remind me of there? Mm. Forget exactly what that was going to say, but um, tapping into were, older people, yeah, experience, um, we're rites so of passage. stuck in our echo chambers. Yes, that, um, you know whether that's social media or our workplaces. One of or the things, our friend that, groups. Exactly, we tend to gravitate towards people who are like us, who share our values. Hmm. Um, one of the things I encourage people to do as part of my training is to engage with someone who thinks very differently to themselves. Hmm. Be, because there's a learning in that there's a you know you challenge your own views you say why do I think that because we you know we all have opinions on a variety of topics um, some of them that we very passionately hold and we often form those opinions based on very little evidence yes it's just a feeling or somebody told us once that this was the case oh yes yes that's definitely yeah. the case 
that's and solidified in there and you've grown exactly. on life in it. yeah and and so it's very easy to dismiss someone who's different from ourselves mm. but um you know one of the fallacies that you know teach about is um ad hominem the the person you can attack the person and say oh i don't know donald trump i don't like donald trump oh, so so easy <laughs> right <laughs> he's, he's an easy person yeah, yeah. it's like but it doesn't mean that every single thing he says is rubbish yes because you know he might have some very valid ideas and you know other people feeding him some good ideas um hmm. so to dismiss everything that he says because he's donald trump is losing out on the potential for a, an interesting different perspective on something yeah and likewise you know barack obama people might be like oh barack obama's great everything he does is great yeah yeah he's great he's great there's a lot of stuff he did that was rubbish but exactly yeah he's we're nice, all awesome president. gray you know it's not black and white there's always this gray messy middle mm. that um and i think we need to allow i was introduced for. to the concept of mental spaciousness okay. where you can engage in a discussion and um, almost suspend your beliefs mm. and yet still engage in the discussion. And, and part of it is, is resisting the temptation to get triggered yes. in the discussion. Yeah. But then look at it from the different sides and merits and sides, what you're going to take and what you're not. Mm. I mean, the, get the, best, the best example of a, of a discussion that would require mental spaciousness is discussing discussing the leadership style of Hitler okay yeah. because we all know what he did and mm. what he was responsible for mm. yet you look at the number of people that he mobilized and got mm. going and stuff so from a leadership perspective you have to study him yeah yeah he mobilized people to do mate ama mm. amazing and unamazing mm. and terrible things but he mobilized people yeah and to engage in that discussion requires a large amount of mental spaciousness mm. and it requires um, the ability to sit and listen to other people. And, and, uh, and I was introduced to the idea of um, different depths of listening. So the top bit is I listen to you, but it has to go through all my beliefs and values. And mm. so we'll compete a lot of it, like you've just spoken about. Mm. But then there's another depth of listening where you just open up and you shut up and you listen. And, and I, do, I, I do it in the podcast. And, it, and it, the, the metaphor I use is like, people will drop leaves. And instead of them being blown away in the, the wind of my beliefs and mm. all of that, I allow them to settle gently in me. And then I go, oh, look what that's done. <laughs> and then it changes me. Yeah. And now I am different yeah. from the start and end of a podcast. Yeah. Um, but through that, it means I get to take on board, try the t-shirt on of somebody else and mm. then have a look around. Mm. Yeah, mm. and that's great a great skill to have, I think. Mm. Um, and it's you, I don't think it's possible to do that all the time. No. It would be so uncomfortable. <laughs> no, it's not. But to but it, put yourself into that mindset and go, right, I'm just going to engage with this person or to, to choose someone and, you know, you can specifically mm. set it up and say, hey, I would really like to listen to your views on this particular topic. Um, and that kind of empathy and, you know, like you said, trying on their T-shirt, walking in their shoes, whatever, whatever way you want to think about it. Um, it's, it's uncomfortable if they're very vastly different to you, but there's a lot to be learned from that. And why is that uncomfortable mm. for you? And what values does it um, butt up against mm. that you hold? And why do they hold those values? What's their life experience? What's their... Um, cultural view you mm. know there's so much that goes into every single person you know up until right now this point in our lives every single experience has shaped who we are and what we believe so unpacking that is really interesting and powerful mm. to do um but yeah so, it requires so you refer to it as thought diversity yes yeah that's kind of the hashtag <laughs> yeah. thought diversity but yeah absolutely and um you it's know far better than identity diversity <laughs> yes for me personally yeah uh, it is, yeah and it's valuable for personal development but also you know for businesses if you're planning stuff if you're just with a bunch of yes people that are going oh great idea and you're the boss whatever then um you're not challenging yourself you're not moving forward and then when you all agree and you all head off in one direction you're potentially missing out on 
this vast array of other options of things you could do or products or decisions you could be making as a business. Um, and unless you experiment with those, then you're kind of missing out. Um, yeah, so I think dismissing other people that disagree with you is crazy, <laughs> essentially, mm. but yeah, we do it all the time. Um, so I think we probably already started to cover them. What are some of the things that we should, you teach or we should know about critical thinking? in terms of decision-making biases and stuff like that. I think we've probably already uncovered them. We're, them we're starting to get there, yeah. There's some of the more formal aspects of critical thinking, like um, cognitive biases, for example. So um, so there's, oh, there's a big list, if you want to look right. it up on Wikipedia. But some of the more common ones, um, confirmation bias, we've kind of touched on when um, you, know, you go, oh, I think my knee hurts, I think I've got cancer of the knee. Yes. Google, symptoms of cancer of the knee <laughs> and go, oh, yes, look, I tick all these boxes. So you look for information to confirm what you already believe to be true. Yeah. So, you know, that applies to climate change or whether whatever you think about Donald Trump, yep. seeing as he's already come up, um, or uh, what the best restaurant is or, you know, we sort of seek the, we, and we listen to and give more gravity to information that supports what we already believe. Yes. Um, and we all do it. So that's the echo chamber right there. Uh, yes, yeah, essentially. In your own reality. Yeah. Um, something like status quo bias. We are, as creatures, we prefer comfort over discomfort. And so if there's a choice between keeping things as they are or challenging ourselves and stepping out of that comfort zone, we tend to lean towards um, you know, status quo, keeping things as they are. And that's in business or in our personal lives and the choices we make. We go, oh, you know, do I want to move house? This house is okay. Mm. So let's just stick with this. And then the sunk cost bias is kind of similar to that. If you've already invested time or money into, you know, a relationship or um, property or a particular business mm. decision, then um, we give more weight to sticking with that path than is that going. like firm attachment? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I often hear these kind of stories coming from my husband back in town or sort of going around different places and he'll say, oh yeah, well, the, this project is going ahead and X million dollars has already been spent on it. It's absolutely pointless and nobody actually wants it to be done. But because this much has already been spent, they're not going to reverse that decision. Yes. Right? <laughs> no. Feels like you hear it all the time. Um, and actually there'll be another project that they've started, which they've spent 30 million dollars mm. on and you're like well why are they bothering with this one oh well it's already that's been like spent. I, I i read an article it's something to do with um build up of troops on nato fault lines and things like that whereby once you get a critical mass of troops and and, mm. and armored personnel characters and things in a certain area war is inevitable right because okay. they put that much stuff into it it's like well, we've got to do something now yeah yeah it, that's <laughs> exactly sunk cost bias You're like well yeah we have to continue with this course of action because we thought Six months mm. ago, it was a great idea, but yeah. right now, it's a terrible idea, but, ooh, you know, let's carry on anyway. Um, another one, anchoring bias is really powerful. So the first information that you receive, you give more weight to. Yes. So this one's great, like, you know, if you're in business and you think, right, what price shall I put on my product? If you go in and say, okay, this is going to be $1,000. They go, oh, right, okay, it's worth $1,000. If you go in and say it's fifty dollars, people go, "All oh, right, okay, it's worth fifty dollars." Mm. And then if you want to then negotiate on that, you've already set the idea that it's worth X it. yeah. amount. Yeah. So you know, negotiating on a house, then that's the obvious one. If the the real estate agent says it's worth a million dollars, you're like, "Oh, wow, well, it must be worth that or close to that." But if they say it's worth seven hundred thousand, then you're going to come in with your six fifty kind of offer. Um, so that, mm. you know, you see that all the time in marketing. Um, so some of the biases and then, uh, fallacies is one of the other big areas that we touch upon. So I think I mentioned yeah. the ad hominem fallacy. You can sort of attack the person rather than looking at their arguments if you, you know, yes. and that weakens the ability to debate on something. Which is what um, we see a lot of in political debate and absolutely. newspapers and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, my, and my father who, who was over here recently is, was lamenting the lack of proper well for thought through political debate 
that is aired mm. on TV and radio now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, we could blame the media or blame social media and the way that works or whatever. But um, the fact that we, you know, look at a person and judge, oh, look, you know, Boris Johnson does his tie a certain way. That means I'm not going to listen to his policies on mm. education or whatever. You know? Well, that's a rubbish reason to dismiss an argument, like that is. the way someone's dressed, for example. But we, you know, we do it all the time based on a visual thing or a story we might have heard. Um, so that's a really common fallacy. And like you say, you see it in politics, particularly all the time. Um, another fun one is um, appeal to authority. So trying to win an argument by quoting an authority figure. But sometimes that authority figure is not an authority figure in that field. So you might say, oh, David Attenborough, he's amazing, you know, he's a great man, really admire him, whatever. Do I really respect his judgment on, I don't know, underpants? The fact yeah. that he buys his underpants at Marks and Spencer's, I don't know where he buys underpants. But, um, yes. you know, that kind of argument, you go, oh, well, David Attenborough thinks it's great, so it must be great, you know, but David Attenborough doesn't know about underpants. <laughs> I, I went through an, um, an interesting journey with that, whereby okay. after... I think it was 70 or 80 episodes of, of, of doing WA Real. Um, I'd sit and have discussions with people. And I'd say, oh, yeah, but one of my podcast guests said this, and one of my podcast guests said this. One of my podcast. Mm. And, and I found myself, I was talking through the experiences and things that I'd learned through my podcast guests. And, it, and I had this realisation, and I almost thought, crack, I'm going to have to stop the podcast. And mm. I very nearly did. Mm. I went through this for about two weeks where I was like, I, I'm going to have to stop it because where's Bryn and his voice? Right, okay. Yeah. And where's his opinion in the world? Yeah. And then, so, then after a while I managed to put it all back into its box that this was still helping me to grow and expand. Mm. But now, in discussions, now I, I it, it is my view and it is, mm. you know, I, I do less quoting of. Yeah. You've Pocket. kind of kept yeah. those leaves and taken them on board. Yes. To become your own little Bryn mulch in there indeed, somewhere. Indeed, <laughs> indeed. I sort of instead of instead of viewing the podcast as this almost like new chapter in a book by which I can quote and and and, and mm. come through, mm. it is now more of an experience that changes me and opens me up and sees where the leaves lie. Mm. And so, you know, I, I talk through. The mosaic of the leaves as it were nowadays mm. rather than the fact that somebody's given them to me yeah yeah cool. it's very metaphorical i hadn't thought of it before. yeah nice nice go. analogy <laughs> so what other fallacies do we have oh um slippery slope is quite a fun one slippery slope mm. so you know if a happens then b will happen so you say i don't know uh, if if you i don't know open a bottle of gin that's sitting next to you there and have a yeah. have a smell then you're gonna have had 10 shots by lunchtime and yes. be wasted yeah. right we could open it now and have a smell and go oh yeah that's gin and put it back and nothing else would happen but if i was saying to you, no no don't open it because then you'll open the floodgates to all this other awful unlikely stuff yes then um that's the slippery slope fallacy it's trying to talk someone out of doing something yes you know, awfulizing like we'd say you know oh you're gonna they talk about gateway drugs and stuff like that you know if you smoke yeah. pot then you'll be on cocaine by next week you go well that's highly unlikely you can just choose at each point whether to continue mm. sure maybe some people end up down that path but Lots of people don't, but we, we look at the extreme cases because yes. they're more kind of interesting. Go, oh my God, look, it happened to Uncle Steve or whatever. Um, so we give more weight to those things as well, mm. those more um, dramatic outcomes. Um, what else is there? Ad populum. Just because it's popular doesn't mean it's correct. Oh, yeah. And it doesn't mean it's correct for you as well. Ah. Um, so, you know, just because most people send their kids to private or public school it doesn't mean that you have to do it so you know people that are doing unschooling or de-schooling whatever you call it their children and and homeschooling good for them like they've obviously thought about that very much um, and it's a huge commitment um, but to go against what the majority of people are doing is um, is very brave and and they're obviously making choices for them um, and the same goes for you know 
shopping at Woolies or Coles or I don't know working for a living in a sort of conventional environment um, yeah so just because everyone else is doing it doesn't mean it's the right choice for you yes but yeah it's uncomfortable to um, stand out from the crowd in that way as well yes yeah um, so yeah there's a bunch of fallacies there's a whole bunch more but um, yeah we'll probably move on to something else so how do you so who, so who are your typical clients that will present and and how do you work with how do you take things like that and then work with them mm, okay um i don't really have a typical client <laughs> yeah in terms of gender or age anyway um but they're normally just people that are curious and mm. um at transition points often yeah um so you know quite a few people i've worked with are sort of mums or dads who have young children because they're still figuring out how to navigate this new life that they're in. Um, but also, you know, um, business owners um, or people in corporate environments. It can be anything, really. Um, but they, yeah, they're often looking for something, you know? Um, yes. They're, they're trying to figure something out for themselves. Hmm. And so the course is... Um, seems to appeal to that yeah. um, part of you know, someone who's making transitions, whatever that transition may be. Um, and then, yeah, um, just because of you know, my lifestyle and how things go, you know, lunchtime or morning time is a good time for me to do workshops um, or in the evening after seven o'clock. So it's people who have a longer lunch break <laughs> yes. or people who have small children that are in bed by seven sort of thing. Um, but yeah, no, all, all different people, retired people, again, they're trying to navigate what retirement looks like for them and what they want to do now that they've not got work anymore. Right. Um, yeah, all sorts of people. Um, and then what So it's really getting a feel of how their own thinking patterns are keeping them in one place and they can be more expansive to open up mm. opportunities and possibilities yeah. to yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of people come in ruminating on something mm. and then we go through a bit of a process and and then they take those big steps because in their gut they know they want to make a change whatever yes. that may be and they almost are seeking permission and um logical arguments to support this gut feeling they might have that something's not quite where they want it to be um and we'll talk a bit about gut feel in a minute. But um, yeah, one of the, in terms of decision making, look, you know, there's all sorts, we kind of reframe what is good and bad in an outcome. Um, you might say, um, I was chatting to someone earlier who'd been made redundant and say, so oh, wow, that's, that's bad. That's a bad thing to happen. But then the opposite, the kind of other side of that coin is, um, you know, she's got three weeks off and she's actually already got another job, which may well be better may take out other places. We can, you know, there's not alternative universes that we have access to, at least. You know, I don't want to get into the physics of it all, but, um, you know, we never know what the other path would have looked like. Yes. We can guess or dream or say, oh, you know, shoulda, woulda, coulda done X, Y, Z, but um, we just have to kind of make the best of where we're at, which is life, really. Mm. Um, so saying, okay, you know, if we... I don't know, if someone was getting divorced, you go, well, that's, oh, that's terrible, but then maybe they'll meet someone else down the track and You've be much happier. Suited. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I love the Shakespeare quote, I think it's from Hamlet, nothing is either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. It's how you hmm. approach something and the, the, the kind of frame you look at it through. Um, and another thing that and I the like The universe using, is inherently meaningless, as <laughs> you put it upon it. Yeah, yeah, hmm. absolutely. Um, Another useful matrix that I use with people is um, how consequential something is and how reversible it is. So something like getting a tattoo, you go, well, it's fairly irreversible, but if I really wanted to, I could get it removed. Um, yeah. How consequential it is in the grand scheme of things, probably not that much. I don't know what the consequences will be. Maybe I'll see someone on the beach, they'll notice the tattoo and go, oh, You've got that tattoo. We should talk. Mine's the same. Yeah. We're friends for life or some, you know, you never yes. know what the consequences will be. But in terms of like 
massive life-changing stuff it's probably not that big a deal um something like getting married is fairly consequential in life yes. <laughs> big scheme of things but reversible. it's reversible <laughs> yeah yeah whereas having a child with someone there's a lot you know you're always going to be connected to that person so i think like um making babies death are probably the big obvious mm. irreversible things there's so many other stuff we think oh i've made this choice and now i'm stuck with this choice forever but often we're not and so i i encourage this kind of more playful attitude of like well why don't we just experiment with it you know a gluten-free diet or something why don't you just try it out for a try week, it out for a week yeah. see what happens if you don't if it makes no difference then great but what's the cost of experimenting and if the cost isn't that great, then give it a try, you know, mm. um, and just have fun with it because you, you never know where that path mm. will lead. Um, so, yeah, I think being a bit playful with our decisions and not stressing too much about the consequences is um, kind of nice. But don't be irresponsible. You know? yeah. <laughs> people to listen and go, yeah, sod it, I'm going to go and do okay, this thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go bungee jump with rope rather than elastic. Yeah. Not that kind of playful. <laughs> Indeed. Um, but, you know, within reason, like, just try it out. Why not? What's, what's the, what have you got to lose? Yeah. Mm. So where, in the framework of this, do feelings and emotions sit? Mm, okay, yeah, we've both got our big notes on this. <laughs> um, so from the thinking, kind of academic perspective, the part for me where it kind of makes sense is if we think about... Um, feeling in terms of gut feelings yes um and then thinking as a more cerebral response to things um and um daniel kahneman's uh academic has done a lot of work on this got a nobel prize very smart man um and he labels See, it now as, you're doing that bio oh uh, yeah yeah, yeah he's right. smart. <laughs> just because he's smart he must know it's just because he's got a phd and he's got lots of letters about. after his yeah, name yeah. uh yeah good point um but See, you see what I've done there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've laid the trap. Yeah. No, I'm joking. trying to invoke his authority, you know. Yeah. But um, so he has a, a book, Thinking Fast and Slow, and he talks about system one thinking, system two thinking. Mm. And if you think about system one, it's our um, intuitive, quick, automatic, but quite biased mm. thinking patterns. And system two is our more logical, slow, cautious, um, perhaps a little bit less biased thinking patterns, that more deliberate thinking. Um, and so just to sit on the fence in terms of which is stronger, the way that he um, explains it is like your system one is it's like an elephant. It's like really powerful, really strong, and it drives a lot of things and mm. just kind of gets away with it. So if you think about like that's the elephant. System two is the, um, what do you call them? Elephant trainer. And so imagine we're in a circus or whatever system two can control system one if it wants to but it has to be quite focused in order to do that yes um and our system two thinking can get tired um like if we're overwhelmed or there's too many decisions in a day and this is this kind of decision fatigue we go oh fuck it i don't i don't care anymore i'm just gonna yeah. have a beer or eat the chocolate or whatever I like he, he makes an analogy that system one like system one's got a sweet tooth. <laughs> you know, we're trying to control this kind of um, more mm. primitive way of thinking that actually controls a vast majority of our choices that we make every day. Um, so yeah, I think our emotions are really powerful. The fact that we have to kind of consciously keep them in check, we have to consciously try and override our kind of slightly more lazy system one to go no actually I do want to get out of bed or uh, I do want to go to this class or I do want to focus on this thing when system one's trying to pull us back to you know meeting our more primitive need for like energy or conserving mm. energy and um, being comfortable and all those things um, so that was is, the kind of thinking angle on is it. the system one almost like a protective layer I guess, yeah, some of its choices would be. Mm. Um, because we have a lot of, we, I find that we build a lot of um, layers of protection. Mm. And, then we, and then we have these responses to them, whether they're flight, fight, mm. 
freeze or yeah. fawn. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of our depression, anxieties, whether they are clinical level mm. or everyday sort of acceptable level mm. to a degree, mm. are born out of these protections and the responses to them. Mm. And not many of us will have um, like one big massive trauma event in our lives, but we'll have a bajillion small trauma events. Mm. So we end up with complex yeah. traumas. Yeah. And to those, we develop response patterns, which are part of that. That system one, yeah. And yeah. it's very much protective. Yeah. How do I protect myself from a perceived threat? Or yeah. even, not even a perceived threat, but it becomes a, a, an habitual triggered response, mm. which then means that we have, I was introduced to the concept of um, emotional flashbacks. So we don't flashback to one big scary event, we mm. flash back to, oh, God, I feel, oh. And so depression can come about from a great sense of overwhelm and not wanting to do anything. Mm. Anxiety is a, I must do something. Mm. I've got to go, I've got to go, I've got to go, I've got to go. Mm. Um, I've been touring this a lot because from somebody who used to be very active, swam to Rottnest, did triathlons, played rugby and stuff like that, I've just switched off from exercise recently. Oh. And that's because I was finding that most of my exercise was driven out of anxiety. Right, okay. I didn't, I didn't want to get old, I didn't want to get fat, I didn't want to do this, <laughs> like that. Yeah. And, and, and it was just getting so bloody fatiguing. Yeah. And then as soon as I actually vocalised that with some of the people I know, mm. um, several other people, particularly men, but ladies too, have just said, fuck, you know, I'm the same. I'm always like, end of the day, shit, I've got to go and get a weight session in, otherwise I'll lose a bit of my strength or this mm. that and the other I need to be mm. and that's just one example mm. and and so I, I arrived I think when I read your post on Instagram where I was at was I I've been at a place where I feel like the the mind people say the mind is very powerful mm. I would argue that the mind is very forceful okay yeah right? yeah in that in our deeper essence in our heart or wherever it is i haven't quite located it mm. is where our true power lies mm. and the power is always there but our mind and the system one protective thinking is very forceful so the best analogy i could give you would be if you take the ocean the ocean's always there and moves. There's a big, powerful weight of water that moves around and can do things. Mm. We can have storms and tempests on the top mm. and they will do destruction, but then they'll disappear. Mm. But the ocean will always remain. Mm. And so power is always there. It can be quiet. Mm. It can be strong. It can be very present and noisy. Mm. But then force will come and go. And I find, that my, I find that our minds and possibly your system one thoughts and are, are the tempests, are the, are, is the force, mm. yet your system two is always present and it's the power if we can drop more into that and out of our learnt emotional responses mm. to protect ourselves, that's where we can harness more of our power. I think the other way around, yes. Go on. But yeah. yeah, so your system two is the logical reasoning. Yes, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I, I kind of get what you mean, yeah. Because I had it. System one is the ocean then, and system two is the stuff trying to yeah. do stuff on top of yeah. that. Yeah, because I've had this interesting experience where logical, logical brain, mm. right? <laughs> logical brain has been very successful in life to date. He did really well at school. Mm. He did really well at university, where it's all about get things right, don't get things wrong, look smart, mm. all of those things. And, um, and then I became a business consultant mm -hmm. for 15 years. Mm. Same thing. Look right, look smart, don't look stupid. <laughs> you know, look like you're worth the day, right? Uh -huh. and, and just of recent, it's just got fucking tiring. Yeah. I can't, 
I struggle, I can't do it. And as I consider moving from that world to another world, built off a podcast and real legacy and stuff like that, now instead of offering smart bread to the marketplace, which I know and can control and stuff Mm. and presents and delivers, now I'm offering all of bread. Mm. And I'm delivering an experience and I don't know what the outcome is. Mm. And it's scary. It is. I dropped into the abyss for a while with it. But I guess that's what's made me quite acutely aware and why I really wanted to talk to you about thinking mm. and feeling. And now all of a sudden I'm accessing all these feelings mm. and, and I'm not so scared of being angry. Because previously for me, man plus anger equals destruction. Mm. So I get very scared of it because mm. um, I didn't want to destroy things. Um, but now find man plus anger channeled appropriately mm. is the fire that gets a lot of shit done. Mm. Yeah, a lot and so of if shit. you can channel those feelings, that can be incredibly yeah. powerful. Yeah. As opposed to what Bryn used to do, which was put <laughs> them in a box, mm. and that gets tiring. Mm. I did find, actually, the first time I ran this course, um, with a few people who were a bit older than myself, who maybe hadn't been brought up on that, you know, feelings are okay, it's okay to cry, and it's okay Mm. to feel sad or traumatized or whatever. Um, It really, you know, just week one, we dug into a bit of why we do certain things, what's created those habits, those patterns in our thinking. Um, And geez, the, you know, just asking why a few times, like a kid would do, why do you do that, why? Three or four levels of why. Three or four levels. was like opening a massive pit of complex stuff that um, I was surprised and wasn't quite expecting and, and I think surprised some of those people too um, mm. and, and the need to unpack that a little bit. And, you know, I'm not a counsellor. I think as a teacher there are elements of, you know, listening and counselling people a little bit. But, mm. um, yeah, those, those feelings... Do you find big emotional release? Yeah. Oh, yeah. People were telling me all sorts of things, um, which was beautiful. And I felt really privileged to, um, you know, listen to them and give them space to do that. Um, But I was, yeah, I was quite surprised um, Mm. how much it unpacked for people. Even just that simple why um, led to quite big epiphanies for people. But again, I think it's they're, they're coming to that. They've chosen to do something like critical thinking because there's this gut feeling of I, I need to yeah. deal with that. Or it's interesting, whatever. gut feeling mm. leads you to go mm. to a critical thinking. Mm. Mm. And, uh, and yeah, and don't get me wrong, I didn't, I didn't want to have you on the podcast so I could go, right, thought, uh, feelings are way, <laughs> way better than thoughts. Cause, no, no, no. Because no. we have them both yeah. and they have their role and yeah. they have their place. Yeah. And I think if we can understand them more, mm. We can harness. How would you see it as harnessing both? Um, I think I, uh, I did like a, f- a few different people from a psychology perspective came at me and said, well, obviously the sort of structure is thoughts control feelings and then feelings control actions and that action then determines your behaviour and then obviously your behaviour then determines your whole life. Hmm. Um, but the people that were coming with that or from it's fairly very academic, yeah, and a fairly like logical yeah. point of view. Um, and academia whereas... has overlooked feelings. Probably, yeah. I mean, okay, my two degrees in psychology were like seventeen and twenty years ago. Right. Okay. But it, they tend to be sort of murky mm. and less predictable. Yeah. Yeah. And. And even just listening to what you said there, you know, as in we have these thoughts that make feelings that make actions. Yeah. Well, if you go and speak to anyone in sales and marketing, they will tell you that you sell off emotion. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And then you logically justify it afterwards. Mm, mm. So, you know, you, you come back with an, you know, Bethan comes back with a new pair of shoes, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, that's an emotional purchase completely. 100%. Yeah. But then when you go and show, Mr. Wynn, yeah. I don't know his name, and you, <laughs> I go, really oh, and you, go, you go, I really needed these new shoes, because you know, they're, they're, they're yellow, not like the red ones, and they go with it, and so it's all <laughs> logical, logical, and they were a deal. Yeah, yeah. 
yeah. you know, reduce from 120 down to 30. <laughs> I couldn't not have them. Yeah, yeah. But then let's be honest, really, you looked at them, they lit you up yeah. and you bought them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and, yeah, we and, do. And sales and marketers mm. know this. And that's why storytelling is so trendy at the moment, like, or mm. it seems to be from my LinkedIn and stuff. Like everyone's yeah. about, it's about telling that story. Yes. Um, and even science communication, I was teaching for a while at Taylor's, um, trying to create a narrative around your discovery or around mm. why it's important or how it's going to change people's lives connects your idea to people much more strongly than mm. and, 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 which is what we tend to do with scientific information. There's more, there's more, there's more. Yes. And we overcomplicate it. So something like climate change science, which, you know, we should all be going constantly, like feeling emotionally about shit, the, this is happening and it's real and the fires are just yeah. such, to me, clear evidence that something's not not mm. as it was or as it yeah. should be in the world. Um, but we can tell ourselves stories, oh, no, but it's, it's a freak thing or whatever. And, and it's really fucking uncomfortable to go, actually, you look at the science behind climate change, we should all be like Greta Thunberg going, I'm fucking panicking <laughs> and I'm worried for my kids, but we go, oh, it's too hard to deal with. The emotion is too much. It's too scary. It's too uncomfortable to face the truth of that. And so we go, so we've, I'm so going to go look at my shoes. So we fly. <laughs> exactly. So we fly to wait and avoid yeah. Yeah. Uh, or freeze and, mm. and, and avoid. And then we build a story mm -hmm. which makes us feel better, yeah. which is otherwise known as a lie. Mm. And, and we tell ourselves lies and then we believe those lies and it's yeah. like well you know. and the stories we tell ourselves and the stories we so tell powerful. ourselves because you're yeah. all part of cognitive politics and stuff yeah, yeah make ourselves exactly. feel better to move ourselves into a better place of feeling yeah I did have some interesting discussions with people who are more um, kind of spiritual um, yoga mm. mindfulness background and they were much more like feelings absolutely feelings mm because they've you know, witnessed in themselves and other people what happens when you try and control your feelings, particularly something like grief um, or love perhaps, like trying to bury them down, um, then they can manifest physically in yep. people. Um, or um, another lady I spoke to the other day, she was talking about a session where she just cried the whole yoga session because there was stuff going on she wasn't dealing with and in that safe space, you know, logically she was like, well, I'm present, I'm here, I'm doing yoga, nothing's wrong right now. But there was so much other stuff going on that she'd been dampening down that it just all came out. And she yes. was just crying for an hour about, she didn't know what, and she couldn't stop herself. Yeah. They go, yeah, that's what happens. Like, when you just bury things. Yeah. Um, you, can't, yeah. you can't contain that energy. Mm. It's gotta go somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And I find emotions are very, almost like energetic. Mm. And it has to go somewhere. You yeah. try and push it down or this, that and the other. So yeah, it'll mm. physically manifest it in your leaves in your body. Mm. Or it'll just come out and it'll be untidy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we get scared of untidiness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. But untidiness can be necessary. Yeah. I, mean, I think I do like physical release of, you know, if you're feeling stressed or angry, you're talking about exercise before, I'm really into exercise and I think it's such a good feeling when you're pissed off at something or someone and you can just punch something or run really fast and just release it in that way. Mm. Um, and I saw all the time with my students back in London, you know, there were teenage girls and a lot of them weren't you know they were into kind of dancing or other things but they there was a lot that weren't particularly sporty and then they lived a lot in um you know quite small flats small spaces yeah they'd like walk to school or whatever but if they weren't doing some kind of sport or the um, army cadets was very popular with them um then you could see this kind of frustration pent yeah. up in them and then occasionally that would just explode out with some of them, you know, really lovely girls, super polite, and then occasionally they just have this like so fucking angry at the world, and yeah. they would take it out on me as their form tutor. And I'd be like, oh, where did that come from? Yeah, and then they'd feel bad about it. And I'm like, that's all right, I know it wasn't 
Yeah, really... and then they'll get into another spiral that mm. contains it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, another friend was talking about um, from her perspective working with young people, if there was something in their childhood or adolescence, some kind of trauma, then those people, generally speaking, <laughs> generalisation is a fallacy, but mm. um, generally speaking would have more trouble controlling their feelings um, than someone who's had a fairly stable, steady, loving childhood and adolescence. Mm. Um, so to say, you know, oh yeah, definitely this or definitely that, it's a false dichotomy yeah. of like black and white, yes, feelings or yes, thoughts. Um, it depends completely on the person and how they've been brought up. I think you can learn to manage things differently. I don't want to say better because who's to say which is better? More productively. Uh, yeah, perhaps more productively. But then again, productivity, like let's back to that mm. rat race mentality. Oh, yeah, is yeah. it better to be an A star student and a, mm, mm. you know, first at university and a high paying job if that's not where you want your life to go, then it's only your own story that you're telling yourself that like, oh, I have to be like this. Hmm. Um, so then to pivot and go and, you know, do podcasts and other things, maybe that's a better choice in the end. But because of the stories we tell ourselves, we say, oh, I should do this. I should be productive. I should. Yes. Yeah. And if you're shoulding on stuff oh, should rather than so. wanting, yes. then start to ask some questions, I think. That's a great source of anxiety. Mm. Oh, yeah. Do you think um, some of the pervading cultures and the systems in place are overly th focused on thought, logical thought, as opposed to the inclusion of some sort of emotion feeling? Mm. I mean, the best example I can give you would be uh, one that's quite pertinent to me is like the legal system. Mm. You know, you, the legal system is very left-hand side of the brain, logical, rational stuff. Mm -hmm. Yet, when you get in instances like I have with the family courts, mm. that's flipping emotional, isn't it? Mm. There's your kids involved and stuff like that, mm. and yet. You're expected to approach it in a just and logical manner. Mm. And it's like, whoa, what's going on over here? Yeah. And and it <clears throat> I don't know, I, I feel like there is that's just one example, but I feel like there's lots of things that have logically made sense but don't quite really work mm. anymore. Yeah, it's such a good question. Hmm. I think I heard your interview with the lady who dealt with divorce law mm. a couple of weeks ago and um, she was saying a similar thing about, you know, oh, you need to kind of, <laughs> wrong word, but divorce the emotion from the transactions. Yes. And, and I think traditionally that more logical, reasoned um, ideas have been rewarded by society maybe. Yeah. But there's I mean, particularly a lot for more. you and I growing up in the UK. Yeah. Stiff yeah. upper lip. Oh, yeah, shit. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I think that's shifting a little bit, but it's still not quite there um, for me yeah. personally anyway. You know, the fact that um, Prince Harry and Prince William have come out as the royal family going, oh, mental health is important and we need to talk about it. But, mm. you know, um, when I was struggling as a, a new teacher and I you know, went to the doctor and said... I think I'm depressed, I'm crying all the time. I was essentially just exhausted, which was one of the triggers for us to you know, look at alternatives. Um, I didn't run to my employer and say, hey guys, I think I'm a bit depressed. I could do with some time off here, mental health, because I was so into what, well, but the, the, my students need me and the school needs me. And if I take two weeks off, then it's gonna like shit on all my colleagues because they'll have to cover and I have to plan ahead and stuck in that. Oh, I should, I need to, should, should, I've should. got to yeah. kind of thing. And, and partly that's values, right? It comes back to me not wanting to, um, you know, let people down or um, not wanting to admit weakness in that particular context. Because you can imagine a bunch of teenagers, they go, oh, 
where's miss oh she's she's at home crying you know yeah. <laughs> you try and come back halfway through term with that and they're all pissed off they haven't done their GCSE essays or whatever um you know me now I'd say well that was brave to do but I wasn't um brave enough at the time if I'd have done that I just yes. carried on um and and you know showed up did the best that I could at the time and you know I still sort of I was giving my all because I really cared about it um, mm. so there's that lesson as well you know about the balance of how much of yourself you're willing to sacrifice for whatever the outcome is professionally mm. or for the community or whatever it is that you're doing for your family um, something a lot of mums struggle with is you know if you are giving 100% to looking after your family then there's nothing left for your own mental, emotional, physical health. Um, and so you see mums that are like, oh, you know, I stopped exercising or I just eat whatever or I drink more wine or whatever it is to cope with, you know, what is a daily balancing, juggling, ridiculous mm. plate spinning act that is parenthood, um, but is life really for a lot of people. But, you know, mm. putting my kind of mum perspective on that, it's... Um, yeah, you need to kind of get the balance right, I suppose. Mm. And there is no perfect. <laughs> no, there isn't. It's yeah. what works for you. Yeah, exactly. But it, I just, you know, coming into this, I was thinking about it. <clears throat> that and, um, well, a previous podcast guest, Richmond Heath, who brought Tremory to the UK, uh, to Australia, which mm. is about bringing on involuntary tremors. So, you know, we fight, flight, freeze. Mm. Um, but our fight and flight is not actually punching or running away. Mm. All of them are, tend to be stationary. And so tremoring is about, like the rest of the mammals in the animal kingdom do, releasing mm. trauma and stuff from your body. It's been, I've been doing it for a year. It's been like oh, a wow. secret weapon. Yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> I had reason to um, exchange messages with Richmond the other day or phone him up and then the usual thing phone tag da 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 mm. and then he rings just before I'm about to go into a meeting right mm. and and this made me think about the semantics we use in life mm -hmm. because I said hey Richmond can't talk now I'm just about to head into a meeting but let's talk in an hour and he sent a, 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 a message straight back saying Sure, let's talk in an hour, but wouldn't it be great if we hearted into a meeting rather than headed into a meeting? Do you think we'd get more done? Aww. And and like, <laughs> it's really small, mm. but at the same time, it's huge. Mm. You know, we, we, I was thinking a lot of our lexicon and everyday language is, is, is thought mm. orientated. Mm. Yeah, I find that fascinating. And they say, you know, um, uh, gardeners multiple intelligence, so the way that we learn um, might be kinesthetic, you know, the physical touching things, mm. might be seeing things. For other people, it's auditory, hearing things. Um, so things like that influence the language we use. Like, oh, I see what you mean is more likely, they say, uh, yeah. in theory, that's a visual person. A yeah. Visual, yeah, yeah. Um, or I hear what you're saying is a more mm. auditory. And so it's how we kind of perceive the world. Yes. Um, but you're absolutely right. The, the way that you frame something like we were saying that oh I've got to do this thing or I should do that yes. or I need to do this and if you say actually I, I want to because um, or yeah, I get to I get to yeah yes. you know I'm putting the washing on the line and I can be like oh god I hate putting the washing on it and then I go well no I get to wash my children's and husband's and my own clothes yep. with clean water and soap and mm. um, I get to look after them I get to see them every day. I, I get to do this small act of love, um, which is what they always are. It's you know it's hard to remember those things, and mm. I can put on some funky music and sing along to it in my backyard and shout love to it. my neighbour across the fence while I'm doing it, um, and make it something more joyful, you know. Um, and sure, you know, there's days when you're like, oh crikey, I can't be asked. Yeah. <laughs> But trying to reframe things from that gratitude and joy and hmm. um, you know the the luck of where we're at is yeah. really nice to do sometimes. Outside of the yeah, you get to be in the sunshine in Perth. In an enormous sky. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, 
and that I, you know, got the time to do it rather than, you know, being frantic. I, I'll put it in a tumble dryer. Often those little things, those conveniences that we choose can take away like a small joy. You know, I love riding my bike and I want to try and build that more into my daily routine. I'm like carting two kids with me often as well. But um, doing that instead of driving the car, the kids love it. It's an adventure. They're outside. I get the wind in my hair. I get exercise. I might see someone I know when you're just like rushing from A to B, you don't stop and do those things, you know? Yes. Um, so yeah, finding the, the reframing things can be really nice hmm. um, and a nice reminder that you get to do something. You chose this life, you know, so you yeah. get to do. And you are choosing yeah. all the time. Yeah, exactly. Where do you think WA would be if everybody, well, actually I wrote down here, if everybody did the Beth and Wynn critical thinking course. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got all two, oh. 2.6 million or 2.7 million and then we put them all through. Wow. Um, that's really difficult to answer without putting my own biases on it because it's almost like, well, what would you like it to be like? Yeah. You know, um, I, I think we would... Part of this podcast is the freedom to speak yeah, and share your biases. The, um, I think we would need to seriously look at... Um, mining and energy production and i don't know how we transition from you know because perth is so built on that as an economy um so we need to uh, i think we would be looking at the future and saying this is not sustainable um we need to explore the alternatives right now um and that's my own personal kind of view on it i think mm. from um i think people would work fewer hours. I, I think working part time is like if, if people choose to continue to work, they don't all quit their jobs. Um, uh, because Oh, yes, because you'd, you'd, you'd ruffle up the entire employment sector. Yeah, you? yeah. But we're, we're not everybody. I meet people with all different values and perspectives on it. But um, there seems to be a lot of people caught up in the, you know, the big house, but Australia has some of the biggest houses in the world. Um, and needing to pay the mortgage on those, like, it's insane. We've mm. created society as a whole. We're all complicit in this um, rat race that we've created. Mm. Um, and before I had children, it was like, well, you work full time and that's just what you do. And it's only taking some gaps. And, you know, uh, my husband and I have each had long kind of stints off work to play with other ideas and do, try other things because. Um, you know, we chose a smaller house, we chose a smaller mortgage, uh, we chose to put ourselves in a position where we could do those things. Mm. Um, and um, yeah, I think not everyone, but a, quite a few people would um, just change how they put their lives together, the jigsaw mm. pieces that they choose to include. Yeah. Um, and uh, me personally, I think I would love to see more um, you know, connection with people in the community. Um, not this kind of, oh, I'm too busy, you know. I love buy nothing um, Facebook groups and um, I'm part of Repair Lab and, you know, with my, I've struck a manager as of this evening. <laughs> All right. uh, which is like, oh, God, you know, but also what a privilege, you know. I get to help out my neighbours and look after them and I wouldn't be in a situation to take that on if I was busy working all the time. Yes. And so and, and the community that we've created in my little strata is beautiful. Um, and, you know, having fish and chip Fridays and just taking a moment to check on them or have a chat. Little things like that are actually what make people happy, I think, at the end of the day. It's mm. the small pleasures. And so if we didn't work as many hours and have this, like, oh, yeah, I've got to be on. And, you know, I, I chose to... Um, start my own business because <laughs> I thought that it would be more flexible with the children and it is to some extent but there's this self-created pressure of oh I need to be posting on multiple social media platforms or I need to be meeting everybody who wants to for coffee and I have to really put boundaries on that myself and yes. just go right I'm actually I'm just gonna switch my phone off for a couple of hours and really do a thoughtful, longer piece of writing, or I'm going to connect with my husband, or I'm going to play with my kids, because it can be very easy to get dragged in all directions. Um, 
you know, no matter, I think, what life you're leading, there's all these, like, external pressures constantly trying to, you know, you feel like you've got to um, honour in some way. And mm. it takes a bit of guts to go, actually, no, today, this is, these are my values. This is what I want to focus on. And this is what I will feel good about at the end of the day. And it's generally not those little annoying kind of things that are pulling at you. It's the whatever's you, whatever is your most important thing, right? Whatever yes. you value the most, um, which is different for everybody. Mm. Yeah. What have you learned about yourself through doing all of this? Oh, God. <laughs> um, what have I learned about myself? Um, I am just as susceptible to distraction and... Um, mm. Uh, people pleasing sometimes and trying to and fallacies and bias and fa oh absolutely the more you learn about them the more you realize that you do them yes um, and um, I think it's called a Diane Kruger effect something you know you, you think you know a lot about something and then you learn a bit and you go oh crap I know nothing I'm Jon Snow I'm right down here yeah and so I'm slowly going back up this scale but um, I am loving the process um, so much. I don't know if you saw my really soffy post the other day. No. It was my birthday the other day and I was like trying to do a little reflection about values or something. And I just kept like crying, but happy crying. Yeah. I'm doing it now. Um, I'm so fucking lucky and grateful to be in this position where I'm learning and growing and it's uncomfortable a lot and I'm sure you find this right you try something new you know doing a podcast I'm like oh I'm doing a podcast yeah but but this has been so enjoyable and um yeah um yeah I feel really privileged to be doing it and um uh and, and I'm you know we're all human and I've really learned how valuable those connections are and just having a a nice conversation <laughs> it's mm. just so so lovely and you don't do that very often if you're just caught up in the busy doing 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 yeah 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 exactly mm. what do the next three to five years look like for Bethan uh -huh. ideas plans targets um, goals I want uh, I want to sort of slowly grow doing this critical thinking stuff decision making whatever it's gonna look like um, and, you know, my children are sort of a big influence on my time and what's available. So they will, you know, gradually transition to full-time school and stuff. So I'm really looking forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> Just shipping them both to one location for a particular time, picking them both up from yeah. the same location because there's, yeah, you know, just delivering bodies to various locations takes up a lot of time but you know there's thinking time in that and it's yeah, an yeah. honor and a privilege that I can do that and I'm lucky to do that um but yeah no I think just sort of building on the blocks that I'm laying down yeah hmm. and what does Bethan do to stay grounded and amongst all this critical thinking <laughs> <laughs> um I try and journal regularly. I think that's really valuable and really useful thing to do. Um, and is that expanding on thoughts and feelings or today I did? Um, I've got two types of journal. So one is a sentence a day thing. So it's just three little lines and, and that's very nuts and bolts. I just write down what I've done in the day, um, like bullet points. And I like that because it's a three year one. I can look back and go, oh, this time last year I did this. Right. Um, and my days. Oh, so you go through it and through it and through yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've gone through two of those already. Wow. And I've just started a new one. Um, and I love that looking back and going, oh, we were here, we were there. And, and um, you know, particularly when I was at home with the kids, like each day looked quite different. It'd be like, oh, we went to this playground with this person or mm. oh, I caught up with them. Um, and now it's like, oh, I went for coffee with this person off LinkedIn or I met this person yeah. off Instagram and, and you know, or we did a workshop together. So that's quite fun, you know, seeing how it's evolved. Um, but I also do like longer journaling where it's like, particularly if I'm feeling a bit stressed about something, then I'll just work write it down out. and go, yeah, why, why am I feeling like this? What's the, yeah. Mm. So I guess that's probably my most grounding thing that I do, yeah. Mm. And the last question that I ask all my guests is, if you could take a little nugget of information and upload it into the collective consciousness, 
what would that be? So everyone just gets it. Um, oh, crikey. Pressure. <laughs> yeah. um, I think just, yeah, taking the time to stop and listen a bit more. Hmm. Listening to other people, listening to your own thoughts, listening to your gut feel. Um, yeah. <laughs> Is that good enough? <laughs> Only you can be the answer to that question. <laughs> cool. Bethany, it's been fantastic talking to you today. Thank you. Yeah, if somebody wants it. to find you, whereabouts? Um, so they can go to bethannwin.com um, or just find me on Instagram, bethannwin, critical thinking, um, or you know, Facebook. Add me on LinkedIn. Or building that up. And all of the places. All the places, yeah, yeah. And I think I'm the only... Bethann Wynn, W-I-N-N, in Australia, um, nice. maybe in the world. So that's kind of useful, yeah. Mm. So not Bethany, never call me Bethany, Bethann, yeah, B-E-T-H-A-N. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk to Thanks me Thanks so much, Bryn. It's been a pleasure. Cheers. <laughs>